Monday, March 25th, 1991. Uh, tonight we're going to be interviewing another veteran of World War II, uh, which is a interviews and a series that we're doing for the Montgomery County Historical Society. Uh, these interviews uh, will be property of the Montgomery County Historical Society and will be placed uh, in the library for the use of future generations to see the things and the experiences that World War II veterans had during the war from 1941 and through most of 1945. Uh, I might say that my name is Claire Chamberlain. I'm a member of the American Legion here in Crawfordsville. Uh, I'm also a member of the VFW Post at 1431. And some other gentlemen that have helped uh, with the interviews are uh, Ed Miller, who is our cameraman, a member of the Legion and of the VFW, and Mike Hall, who is the executive director uh, here at the Lane Place, where we're doing the taping. Another gentleman that's been very active in making these uh, tapes is a uh, semi-retired attorney, Bob Wernley, a past president of the Montgomery County Historical Society, and now on the board of directors. Uh, today's uh, uh, veteran that we're going to be interviewing is Albert Delano, and uh, Albert, uh, certainly happy to have you with us and uh, agreeing to go ahead and talk about your experiences during World War II. Where were you born? I was born in uh, Putnam County, Indiana, North, or, uh, east of Rochdale. I see. East of Rochdale. When did you come up into Montgomery County? Uh, in 1932, I moved east of Parkersburg. Stayed there on the farm for about seven years and then moved to Newmarket. Mm -hmm. Did you grow up with some brothers and sisters? Yes, I had, uh, uh, there was 12 of us total. There were seven boys and five girls. My goodness. Yeah. That's a big family. Whereabouts were you in the, the line? I was uh, about fourth from the last. Fourth from the last. Yeah. I see. What were your parents' names? Uh, Ernest and Inez. I see. Okay, you moved up to uh, into Montgomery County around 1932. Right. Uh, where'd you go to school? Went to school at Parkersburg uh, until they closed it, and then we came to Newmarket. I see. Did you go to um, high school in Newmarket? I went to high school in Newmarket, yes. I see. Two years, and then I worked on the farm for a fellow and went to Wayland School for my junior and part of my senior year. Yes. Might I ask you what year you were born? Uh, 1925. 1925. I see. I see. Um, how did uh, you happen to get into the military? I was drafted. You were drafted. Yeah. Had you thought about going into the military before that? Yes, I, I quit uh, my senior year of high school. I quit to join the Marines and went over for my physical and failed that because of flat feet. So I didn't think I would be called for the Army, so I came home and went back to work, and uh, I got married. Got married in March, and three months later, the Army drafted me. Yeah, who, who did you marry? Uh, Beverly Cope. Beverly Cope, I see. She's still living? Still living. Mm -hmm. Still living together. Yeah, we'll, good. We'll, we'll come back uh, to your family a little later on, uh, Albert. Uh, You'll notice, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be calling him Ab. I've known Ab for quite some time, and uh, it just seems natural yep. to, to say Ab uh, to you. Uh, you said you were drafted. Um, did you volunteer for the draft then, or did your number finally come up? And My number came up, and they, they called me, and we went to Fort Bend for our fiscal, Fort Benjamin, at Indianapolis, and I passed the fiscal and no marks against me. The flat feet didn't make any didn't difference. Didn't make a bit of difference. <laughs> okay, how long were you over there going through your physical before you chipped out, so to speak? Well, they, uh, I don't remember how long after the fiscal we came back home and I don't remember how many days we were here before they called us and took us to Macon, Georgia for my uh, basic training. Mm -hmm. How long were you at Macon? Three months. What did you do in basic training? Well, it, uh, it was uh, I was in the heavy machine gun section, and uh, the reason they put me in there, uh, we test fired, and 
I did so good with the heavy machine gun that they put me in the heavy machine, machine gun section. But we took a lot of more basic training like ever a soldier took for us there. A lot of marching. Marching, force marching. Mm -hmm. yeah. You were there for three months, uh, Ab, then where did you go? I went from there to, well, after we got finished our basic, we got a week's leave. I came home, stayed a week, and then went back to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and joined the 100th Division there. Is that an infantry division? That was an infantry division. And I was in H Company, which is heavy machine gun. Mm -hmm. How did you get to, uh, when you left there, and went, where did you say you went to? Fort Bragg went to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. Camp Kilmer. How did you get there? Uh, by train. Was that a troop train? Yes. Your entire division? Uh-huh. We went by train to Camp Kilmer and uh, stayed there a few days, I forget how many, and until our ship came in to take us overseas. What kind of a ship did you go overseas on? It was a, it was a converted ship, been converted to a troop carrying ship. It held our whole division. And all of our supplies and equipment. It was a large ship. Mm -hmm. Did they have a bunk for you to sleep on? Yes. <laughs> They had food? They had food. Some food. They had, uh, they had a lot of food. And uh, a lot of the soldiers uh, were sick, like I was, but I went ahead and ate because I'd been told if you eat, you won't get real sick. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them didn't eat, and they did get sick. They got real sick. I see. On the ship, did you know where you were going? No. Were there other ships in the convoy? Yes. I don't know how many, but we were in the convoy. Were they like destroyers and battleships? Yeah, we had uh, destroyers following us, you know. They went back and forth to watch for subs and so on. Did they sight any subs? No. None inside of the did, convoy. Did they sight any enemy at all? No. Not that I know of it. At that time, they were. The Air Corps, the German Air Corps, was pretty well knocked out. Mm -hmm. What would the, approximately what date are we talking about? Probably in October of 44. October of 44. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how many days were you on the ship going? 14 days. Mm -hmm. And you landed in? Marseille, France. And they had um, the harbor there in Marseille, the Germans had sunk, sunk their ships in the harbor, and we couldn't get up close, so we had to use uh, LSTs or whatever you call those troop carrying ships to go on into the harbor because the big ships couldn't get in because of the sunken ships. Was my safe secure at yes. that time? Yes, it was. Okay. And uh, on these LSTs or a similar type of craft, you went ashore, and right. then what did you do? We uh, took our our equipment out to the out. I don't know where it was at. It was outside of Marseille and in, in the foothills of the mountains. of some mountains there, and uh, we made trips back and forth, uh, ferrying our uh, equipment out there. And uh, just like our machine gun was uh, in Cosmo, even we had to clean that, and that was a terrible job. <laughs> It was cold, you know, and we had to use gasoline to clean that cosmoing off that machine gun to get it ready to fire. Fire. I see. And everybody's equipment was like that. After you left Marseille, you start going into the mountains then area? No. No, we went uh, we went by truck to Baccarat, France. And uh, there we relieved the thirty sixth division. Who, and that was the front line. I mean, they were in contact with the Germans there. And they had been in Italy, and uh, they were low on troops. I mean, they had a lot of casualties. And we relieved that whole division there, back right in France. Was that your first experience with combat then? Yes, it was. Was the enemy fire pretty heavy? Yeah, it was. And, uh, it was heavy, and they had... Uh, Put mines and I, the first day I was there, I saw a jeep run over a, 
a mine and blow up two men in it. Mm -hmm. Right directly behind my bunk. Mm -hmm. Right behind your bunk. Right, I mean over his W. Where did you sleep after you got there? In foxholes. That was it. Did you uh, were you able to sleep? Yeah. Yeah, I got some rest. Uh, what did you eat? Uh, we had uh, K rations that we carried with us all. Was the enemy close enough so that there was any hand-to-hand -hand fighting? No, I never got into that. Not in the heavy machine gun out there that I was in. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the riflemen got into that, but I didn't. Okay. Keep, keep talking now. In fact, Lee, uh, take us now, if you can, uh, Ab, and take us right up to the time that you come face-to-face -face with the enemy. Okay, we, uh, we kept advancing, we'd, we'd advance every day, and, uh, and then in an the evening we'd stop and dig our foxholes where we'd stay all night, and, and it was always, and I don't know why this was, but it was always the machine gunner's job to uh, stand guard at night. Every night, the, the rifleman didn't have to, and the rifleman got to go through the towns, and we didn't. We never did go into that town. The heavy machine gunners did and we thought that was a bum deal, but anyway, that was part of it. <laughs> and uh, we kept advancing, and uh, finally one morning, well, I'll tell about the, uh, the one thing that I remember most was uh, the riflemen were trying to cross the river, and uh, the, machine gun, the Germans had machine guns set up on the other side, and they couldn't cross every time they'd start down through there. Well, uh, machine gunners had opened up, so they called us in and had us set up our machine guns and, and fire over our troops as they was going down to that river. And we knocked the uh, German machine gun nest out and they crossed that river without any problem. You don't recall what river that was? No, I don't. It might not have been a major river no, that we recognized. No, it wouldn't be. Okay. But it was in the foothills of the Bulgy Mountains. I see. And anyway, we uh, went on up into the mountains and uh, we were pretty close to the top of one mountain and, and uh, we dug in and the next morning for some reason and I don't I never have understood what uh, my squad and another squad of heavy machine gunners didn't move out when the rest of the troops did and we were two squads of us left for maybe 10 15 minutes and uh, what we didn't know was that the Germans were waiting and watching for just that sort of a thing, where they cut off a small group of men. And so we took off and we got on top of this mountain, and then uh, they started laying uh, mortar firing on us. And they wounded a lot of them and killed some. And, uh, and what I didn't know, uh, my buddy was a uh, uh, weapons carrier, and he he got hit real bad, and I went back to look at him, and we didn't bother to set up our machine guns because we didn't know that the foot soldiers were coming, the German foot soldiers were coming to get us, and uh, so we didn't set those up, and I went back to see about uh, Barnhouse, who had been hit real bad with mortar fire, and uh, then the small arms fire started, and all I had was a pistol, being a machine gunner, all I carried was a pistol, and uh, so Barnhouse was lying on his uh, carbine. And I had to turn him over and he screamed terrible when I did it. It hurt him. Mm. But I got his carbine and, and used it to fight with. And uh, I saw my lieutenant get captured. And uh, there was two German soldiers had him and someone, I won't say who, and I killed one of the German guards that had him, and uh, the other German soldier hit him in the head with the butt of his gun and knocked him out, and uh, I saw what was happening, so back behind me a ways was uh, a drop-off, a cliff, and so I kept firing and scooting backwards, thinking that I'd get to that cliff, I'd drop over that and, uh, and be free, you know, be able to take off. Sure. And, uh, what I didn't know was that the Germans surrounded that mountaintop. And the next thing I knew, I felt a gun in my back, and this German saying, hands de hope, which meant, 
put them up or mm -hmm. <laughs> you get the bullet. So I surrendered and uh, he started uh, me down over the other side of the mountain and I saw a, a boy from the other squad lying there and he had the whole back end of his hip shot off. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I motioned to my guard and asked him if I could help him and he let me. And so I gave him uh, some of the medicine we kept, uh, carried with us in our packs for uh, to keep infection from setting in. And uh, I gave him those and uh, used my Red Cross parcel, I mean bandage, to bandage his wound as best I could. And then I carried him down over the mountain to uh, a German first aid station. And I left him there. And, I didn't see him anymore until after the world was over. I was going to ask you if he lived. Yeah. You saved his life, didn't you? Well, he says I did. I well, know. I think you did, yeah. That's uh, fantastic. Uh, you said that you, the German that, that had captured you, you asked him if you could help your buddy? Yes. And he approved? Yeah. Did he, he did know some English then? Or I did you just motion? I just motioned. I don't think he knew the English. Motion me to go ahead. Was that an officer or an enlisted man? No, he was an enlisted man. I see. Okay. Then, uh, by that time, you and how many others had been captured? Now, the two squads, there was uh, five of us captured, and uh, I was the only one who wasn't wounded out of the five. I see. Where did you take it? And they took us back to a. Well, when I left Gentry off at the Red Cross First Aid Station, they had a house on down the way that they took the rest of us and uh, to be interrogated there and uh, what they didn't know was that our lieutenant, they didn't know he was a lieutenant because his insignia was under his collar and uh, he was the first one that they took back to interrogate and, and uh, when they discovered that he was the lieutenant, of course you had to give your name, grade and serial number, you know. And, uh, they really gave some soldiers a talking to, the Germans did. <laughs> because I they were supposed to separate us immediately. Yeah. Did uh, they abuse you? No. They didn't. they didn't abuse you? No. Didn't abuse any of the lieutenant? No. No, no. Then what, then what happened? Well, we stayed all night in that house, and the next morning they started walking us. And uh, by the way, when we were in these mountains, we were headed for Stuttgart, Germany. That was our, to cross the Rhine of Stuttgart. That's where we were headed. Mm -hmm. And anyway, they started walking us, and uh, we crossed the Rhine. And I don't know if it was at Stuttgart or not, but the bridge was still up, and we walked across the Rhine. And I always tell everybody we walked across that farm shop. That's <laughs> yeah, right. But anyway, we got over there, and uh, we went to the, the next town. They marched us to the next town across the Rhine, and just before we got to the town, the American warplanes came over and bombed that town terrible. And uh, they did, uh, they got one, with any aircraft fire, they got one American plane. They hit it. But anyway, when they, the bombing was over, our guards started walking on through that town, and the civilian population wanted to get us. In the worst way, they would have done away with us, no doubt, if they could have. And our guards took us and uh, took us to a, a civilian prison because of these uh, people trying to get at us. They took us and put us in, these, in this prison and held us overnight in there so that they couldn't get at us. And uh, the next day then they took us out and put us in a boxcar and uh, the, they wasn't any uh, engine hooked up. They just put us in there and locked the door and the American planes came over again and started bombing. And we thought we had had it. Because right. <laughs> that boxcar wasn't, you know, painted or anything for people to understand. Were you getting any food and water at this time? Very little. Very little. Mostly uh, dark bread and water. Let's see. Now, were there five of you in this uh, boxcar? Well, there was more than that. They captured more someplace, and, and they put us all together. Then. Mm -hmm. What, uh, 
at that time uh, in that bus car, uh, and the bombers coming over and no way to get out. What went through your mind? Did you think you were going to get out of there? No, we didn't. And then I was thought they thought we thought sure that they would hit us. They hit a building real close to the box car, but they didn't hit that car. You were lucky. And we were real lucky. Yeah. And well, they took us from there then to a regular prisoner of war camp, and that was the first time that they let us they let us write a note home from there to tell our parents and the loved ones that. We were alive and prisoners of war, and uh, it got through. My wife got the letter. She got the letter. Yeah. Took a long time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I forget how many how many months it was before she found out. That, that was when you got to the regular prisoner of war camp. Well, what was uh, one of the first ones? They, they were at more than one. Yeah, they moved us from there immediately. We just stayed a couple of days there. Then where'd you go? Then from there they. Uh, Took us out and put us on another box car and and took us to Moosburg, Germany, which was about 30 kilometers west of Munich. And there was a, a large prison prisoner of war camp there, Stalag 7A. And that's where we spent most of our time. And most of your six months right. was there. Did they feed you? Not good. Uh, what did you have to eat? Well, uh, of, a, of a morning we had nothing unless we could figure something out for ourselves. And at noon, we'd, uh, they took us to work every day. They put us on a boxcar and haul us as far as they could, could get to, towards Munich until the tractor bombed out. And then they, we'd have to get off and walk on into Munich. And uh, they had us mostly working on the railroads. And there was a big railroad yard there in Munich. And uh, they had us working there most of the time. And at noon, they always had the same thing, soup. And we called it grass soup. I don't know what it was, but it had, at times, you could see worms floating on it. White, like maggots and stuff. But we'd just scoop them off and go ahead and eat the soup, because that's all we had. So you had. You got to eat something. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> that was, that was of an evening, then we get a, a slice of black bread, brown bread, or whatever you call it. Did you have water? Yeah, we had water. Were you all in a big um, holding area with barbed wire around it? Uh, typical looking. Yeah, it prison. was, but uh, also inside that big area was uh, smaller areas that were barbed wire, and uh, there was two barracks in each one full of prisoners of war. And uh, we, there was two barracks in, in our compound, I call it, I don't know what they call it. Mm -hmm. Did they abuse you? Uh, it depended on what you did. If you did things that they didn't think was right, they wouldn't. And it depended on what guards you got. Sometimes we'd get a guard that, that uh, came back from the Russian front, and they were terrible, they were mean. And uh, if, if they thought that you were saying something or doing something that you didn't, shouldn't be, why? I had one uh, older man that had been on the Russian front a long time, and, and we were marching back to come home after a day's work, and uh, he thought I said something, I don't know what, but he came up and grabbed me with the hair and just shook me terrible. <laughs> but I hadn't done anything that I knew of. I didn't know what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. Was there any type of medical uh, treatment available for someone that got bad sick or anything? No. No German doctors there? No. I never did see a German doctor there. Did you lose some of your friends in the prison camp? Uh, no. Not that I know of. I, uh, I didn't see any of them that I was captured with, any of the boys uh, except Sturd Arft, who was from Detroit, Michigan. And uh, he was there in my same compound for a while, and uh, we we go to work together and everything. But uh, finally, they moved uh, some of us out to a small town, and I was moved out, and he wasn't. So we parted there, and I never saw him again until 
in uh, well, it was last year. What was it? He, he was traveling through uh, Indianapolis and he got a map out and saw the town of Newmarket. So he jumped in his car and he, he didn't know if I was still with him. He didn't know anything about me. And uh, he just came to Newmarket and went uptown and asked if I was still there and where. And, and he looked me up. Isn't that? And that was really great. I bet that you were glad to see each other. That was, that was really Yeah, great. That, that would be. What, uh, what about uh, cleanliness? And um, we've heard in the, in the last, uh, in the Persian War that we that just ended, uh, a lot about the condition uh, that some of the Iraqi uh, prisoners were in when they gave up or were captured, such as uh, no food. Of course, we've talked about that, but uh, lack of sanitation, insects and lice and things like that. Real bad. We had, uh, we had no, I, I had no shower, no bath or anything all the time I was in there. And uh, the lice were real bad. And uh, uh, in fact, after we were liberated, that was one of the first things that they did for us was shave us all over and he loused us, they called it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody had lice there. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. What, uh, other than the terrible experience of the whole thing, what was the, and being gone from your family, what was the worst thing about it? Is there, is there something that just, the, well, the whole uh, thing is a nightmare, I know, Ab, but. It was, uh, of course, we were there in the winter time, and it was real cold, and uh, so myself and two other fellows, uh, we, my feet had been frozen at work, you know, and uh, uh, we decided that we was going to try to keep from going to work, and uh, the compound next to us was uh, uh, two barracks full of uh, well, uh, Africans, and they didn't take them to work. They didn't have to work at all. And in that compound, they had trenches dug for bomb shelters. And so uh, we got out and looked at the fence between our two compounds, and we found a place where we thought we could scoop it out enough that we could get under that fence without being noticed. So uh, we used boards and everything to scoop the dirt out and kept it to where it wouldn't be noticeable. And we got uh, deep enough that we could uh, crawl under. And so we went on, went to bed that night. And the next morning we got up early, and uh, the three of us went out and we crawled under that fence, and without being noticed, and got down in those trenches. And we were going to wait until our barracks went to work, and then we was going to get back up and go into our barracks and stay in there where it's warmer all day. Well, the, uh, the fellow who always came in and, and counted us each morning, he counted and he came up three short. And we thought he was a pretty good sort of a fellow, but he wasn't. He was German through and through, and he went and notified the authorities that there was three people missing. And uh, so an officer and some other army men came, and they started around the fence, and they found the hole that where we'd made under that wire. And uh, this German officer didn't say a word, and he just left. And we thought, well, they'd give up, you know. But what he did, he went out our front gate, went into the gate of the next compound where those Africans were, and he came over right above us, took out his pistol, and we thought that we'd had it. I did, I really. I thought he was just going to shoot us, and he could have legally, I guess, for escaping. Escaping. But uh, he didn't. He didn't shoot us. And, uh, he sure. What did he do? He uh, made us get up out of that barrier and go back around. He didn't let us crawl out of the fence. Go back around, getting that line up, and then old Charlie took the count again and had to write him out. And then we walked off to the boss car to go to work. That's an experience. <laughs> But I, I thought sure we'd had it that day. Yeah, well, I would think so. Well, we've covered a lot, uh, Ab, uh, and you were there about six months. Yes. Uh, was every day pretty much like this, with the with the soup, with the worms in it at noon, and a slice of bread at night. Yeah. Uh, some harassment by the German guards. Yeah, depending on 
Did you find any guards that were more sympathetic? Yes, we did. Uh, we got, uh, I, I forget now how often we got them, but we got Red Cross parcels. And uh, in those Red Cross parcels, there was a three pack of cigarettes, a pack of three in a little pack. And for those who didn't smoke, we could take that and we got a good guard and a fellow that was sympathetic, as you say, and uh, he'd take us to Munich and then he would let us trade those cigarettes for an apple or whatever we could get. I see. And we thought that was great if you could get a hold of a guy that would let you do that. And uh, we had one, uh, one fellow in our barracks that uh, he was from New York and uh, he was from a wealthy family and uh, he kind of lost it. And, uh, he would take those cigarette packs and trade it for an apple, and he would go back to the, the barracks that night and he'd put that apple up and he'd set it up there and nobody dared touch it because I think he would have killed you if you tried to cut it. And he had rolls of apples up there and they'd rot. He wouldn't eat them and he wouldn't let anyone else. And uh, he made it. He got so thin that I didn't think that he was going to live, but he made it. Abba, during this time, did you have any idea of the progress of the war? Not while I was installed at 7A, but after they moved us out to this little town of Billsbysburg, they took a group of us, I forget now how many of us went out there, probably 50. And uh, in this town there was a, a two big barns in there and a, a barnyard, and it was a big high wood fence around the whole thing. And they put us in there, and uh, because the prison camp was getting too crowded, that was the reason they moved us out. And uh, some of the uh, fellows that liked to climb, they had the guards get them some white paint. And of course, the guards didn't want to get bombed either. And they got up on those barns and painted PW on the roof. And uh, on both barns, they did that. And uh, there was hay and straw in those barns, and we slept in there. And uh, it was a lot better than the prison camp. How long were you in this barn? Um, how probably, many probably about a month. About a month. Was the food any better? Yeah, it was. The food was better there, and uh, we had uh, one boy there as a, as a guard that they just got off the street to do this, and uh, he was. He was real good to me. He, uh, he would go to his mess hall of an evening and uh, eat, and then he would fill his mess kit and bring it back to the, the barnyard, and, and then he'd give me some of the food. Oh, that's great. That was great. Oh, that was great. <laughs> that was real nice. And uh, this boy, after, after the war was over, I had, I had given him my name and address. And he wrote a letter, and uh, he wanted me as immediately after the, after I got home, and he wanted me in some way to uh, try to help him get a visa to come to America. And of course, I thought about that. Uh, they might have thought I'd been collaborating, collaborating with the enemy if I'd have done anything, and I've hated it ever since. I've lost track. That was the only contact I ever had with. And I've hated it ever since that I didn't try to follow up on but I didn't. No, you, no doubt you made the right decision because yeah. you, you never know in time of war. No, I, the war was still going on at that time. I believe at this time uh, we'll pause for a few minutes. Abby, you were talking there at one time uh, about the, uh, getting underneath the fence, mm -hmm. and I thought maybe you were going to Tell us that you did escape or that you tried to escape. Did, did you have experience with uh, some people that I, uh, tried to escape? I, some of the men in our barracks were uh, English soldiers and they had been in there six years in the prison of war camp. And uh, they had escaped once and they got underneath the boxcars and ridden from the prison camp to the Swiss border. And uh, they 
could see that they crossed the Germans' guards. They crossed by them, so they thought they were safe. And the, they hadn't got to the Swiss border yet, but there was a neutral zone between the two. And they got out from underneath those uh, boxcars, and the Swiss guards wouldn't let them come through, and they handed them back to the Germans. And they'd been back in the prison camp ever since. They'd been there six years when, when I was there. So near and yet so far. Yeah. That if they had stayed on in another few feet, they would have been safe. Do you know of any other attempts at uh, breaking out? No. We we have, go ahead. We could have escaped uh, when we were in this small town. Uh, we worked on the railroads, and uh, when the American planes came over, everybody ran. And uh, we got away from our guards because, you know, you. You ran as fast as you could to keep those bombs from getting in. Uh, one time our guard got in a, a cement guardhouse, a little one one man guardhouse there. He got in that, thought he'd be safe, and uh, the rest of us ran and we uh, got as far away as we could. And uh, after the bombing was over, we went back to the railroad, and that guardhouse had been blown all to pieces and the guard was dead. So uh, he didn't get in a very safe place that time. But we could have escaped at that time, but uh, we knew the war was getting close to being over. How'd you know that? We had a, uh, a one-legged uh, one fellow. He had been in the First World War, and uh, he had a wooden leg, and he rode a bicycle. And every day that man would get on that bicycle and ride as far as he could and tell us, and then he'd come back, and he would tell us how close the Americans were getting to our town. And each day it kept getting closer and closer. It wouldn't take him as long to ride out and back. And uh, he did us, a, he was real good to us. He told us about how close they were getting. And that really helped. Yeah. Did the uh, loved ones back home, did they know uh, anything about your well-being at all? No, nothing at all. Just the one letter? Just the one letter. And your wife got a telegram? Right. She got a telegram missing in action. And then uh, I wrote that one letter home that I was a prisoner of war. And that's all the communication we had. Mm -hmm. How long were you at that, at what you call a barn that you painted uh, PW and white letters on top for safety? About a month. About a month. and. Uh, it was it was a lot a lot better. We had to work on the railroads there, but uh, it was a lot better than the prisoner of war camp. The uh, hay to sleep in was better, and uh, it was cleaner. Everything was better there. Did you still have lice? Yeah, we still had the lice. <laughs> but uh, the guards were good to us, and uh, one time, uh, a few days, just a few days before the. Americans came and liberated us. Some German SS soldiers came through. And uh, of course, they were Hitler men through and through. And they tried their best to get those guards to let them in. And we knew what they wanted. They wanted to kill all the prisoners. And uh, those guards would not let them in that barnyard. And if they, if they had it, we, we wouldn't be there now. That's right. But they, they wouldn't let them in, and so they went on. And there were a few, uh, few young boys, I call them, stayed there and went into the hills of the, outside the edge of town and dug in with machine guns. And uh, then in a few days after those SS troops were there, where I, the Americans came in and, and uh, I, saw, I saw them wipe out some of the machine gun nests of those young boys. I felt sorry for those boys. They, but they, they were firing. Mm -hmm. In other words, this was close enough to the, the, to the, the farm or barn where you oh. were that you could see uh, Allied forces coming toward you. Yeah. And then the, the German guards, when the, when the Americans started coming into the town, the German guards had already made up white flags and uh, they, they let us put them in front and then we all marched out with the white flags flying. So they wanted to surrender without getting 
shot, and we didn't want to get shot either because they had been decent to us there in this little town. And that's how they surrendered. And uh, another thing that might be a little strange is that uh, the, the troops that came in were in armored vehicles, and I looked up on an armored vehicle and coming through that town, and there was uh, Rex Wendling from Rochdale. And I played basketball against him in high school. <laughs> It's a small and, world. And uh, I couldn't believe For it. For goodness sake. Yeah. I bet you were glad to see oh, him. Or glad to see any yeah. American troops. Right. What did what did you do? What did what did you do when they got to where you were? Oh, we were just so happy and uh, and Rex came down and of course we had a good get together there and that evening, uh, for his uh, when it came time for him to eat, he took me through his chow line and uh, you wouldn't believe the food that I piled on that plate. I thought, boy, I'm going to get all the food I can and uh, white bread, first white bread I'd seen. And uh, I piled that on. We went over and sat down and I started eating. I couldn't eat a third of it. You know, my stomach, stomach. was shrunk. Had you lost a lot of weight, Ed? Yeah, I was down to 98 pounds. Gee. And, uh, yeah, you had. Did you uh, finally get a shower? Yes, after that. Uh, they took us back uh, by truck to Stalock 7A, and uh, we were there a few days, and, and uh, they had a great big open field out there where people were staying during the day with nothing to do, just waiting on a chance to get out of there and go home. And uh, I was walking down through there one day and sitting in the middle of this field with thousands of soldiers was that gentry boy that was wounded and I carried down over the mountain. And I saw him sitting there and we got together. <laughs> that was another miracle that we ever got back together again. Yes, it sure is. And uh, Had the war ended then? No, it wasn't over yet. Well, it wasn't over yet. But that, that prisoner, and the prisoner of war camp where he was, had been liberated also. And uh, so they sent them back to Stalock 7 8 to ship out. But, uh, it was taking so long, I don't know how many days we were there, and we, we were discouraged that we hadn't got out of there, so uh, two other fellows and I uh, found out that there was a truck going to this Billsburg where we came from, and uh, so we jumped in the back of that and covered up with a tarp, and we went back to this town, Billsburg, and from there we caught a a mail truck to another town where we knew there was an airport and he, he told us where he was going and he hauled us to this other town and when we got there that's when they he loused us. And uh, another thing that was interesting there in that place, uh, we had our showers and everything and shaved and de loused and different clothes and, uh, and then they took us to the mess hall and fed us before they put us on a plane to head back for Camp Lucky Strike on the French border. And uh, I didn't know it till after I got back home that uh, in that mess hall where I ate, that Joe Haskett was a cook in that mess hall. And we'd been friends back here in Crowardsville before we went to the that service. Right. And I didn't even know that though. And he told me that that's where he was a cook at. Yes, that's that right. was the very time that I was there. That's interesting. You'd have been surprised to see him. Oh, I was a, I sure would have. Yeah, I had no idea. Yeah, that, that's just great. Well, then, then where do we go from there? Well, from yeah. there they they put us on a, a plane and took us back to Camp Lucky Strike, and from there we were to catch a ship home. And uh, we were in this uh, tent for I don't, I forget how many days we were in there, and no movement at all. Nobody was moved out of that tent. And so one day, uh, uh, me and a couple of three other fellows, there was some entertainment came to that camp. And uh, there was this bl uh, blind piano player, and I forget his name. But anyway, he, he brought some people over and put on a show for the servicemen. And uh, so me and a couple of other fellows, or three, decided to go to that entertainment. And we weren't doing anything, just sitting there in that uh, tent. So we went over there. And uh, it lasted well, probably three hours that afternoon. 
And we got back to the tent and there wasn't a soul in there. They'd all shipped out. <laughs> so, so we went up to the headquarters and, and the colonel, he wasn't very nice to us. He said, we ought to be the last ones to leave Camp Lucky's track. And we weren't <laughs> there when we should have been. Anyway, we thought we was going to stay there forever. And uh, anyway, the next morning he was, he wasn't as bad as he acted like. He let us get on the next ship out. Had the war ended yet? Yeah. The war had ended. In but Germany it had Had a message been delivered home that you were okay? No. Not yet? Not yet. I forget now where I was at when I got in contact with them to let them know that I was. Home. Did you? I, I did you know. call or write or? No, I evidently called. Yeah, I, I had called ahead of time, and uh, I don't remember how long how long it was after I called before I got home. Anyway, as we came home, we got on this uh, uh, little merchant ship. It had no, nothing on it except troops. And it bounced around in that ocean like a ball. And anyway, we didn't like that too well. And uh, uh, it took us about, I think it was 14 days coming back also. And anyway, we, we got close to the United States and, and we got up on deck and we looked and we saw the Statue of Liberty. And we thought, oh boy, we're going into New York Harbor. And that, Little merchant ship sailed right on past the Statue of Liberty and went clear down to Norfolk, Virginia. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> and that was a disappointment when they didn't stop in New York. Okay. So you went into Norfolk and did you uh, get discharged from the service right from there or no. where did you go? No, uh, they sent us from Norfolk. We went to Camp Lee, Virginia. And from there I got uh, leave to come home. And uh, I, it might have been there that I called and told them that I was coming home. And anyway, I got a leave to come home and uh, I got home and they were going to send us to Miami Beach for a week's vacation in one of the big hotels down there. Fantastic. And uh, so my wife and I got on a train at Terre Haute and uh, went to Miami Beach and spent a week down there. That's great. And from there we went back to Camp Lee, Virginia. And I stayed there, I forget how long, until they came up with the point system to discharge soldiers, and I had enough points to get out. Mm -hmm. So they sent me to Fort Meade, Maryland, and from there I was discharged. Mm -hmm. Now somewhere along the line, did you, after you were liberated uh, there at the prison camp in Germany, uh, did you go to a hospital? No. Uh, were you debriefed by American intelligence or anything? Anything? Not at all. I see. Did you, uh, then after you left Miami and had your week's vacation, then you, where did you say you were discharged from? Uh, Fort Meade, Maryland. They sent me from uh, Fort Lee, Camp Lee, or Fort Lee, Camp Lee, Virginia. Fort Lee, Virginia, I believe it was. Fort Lee, Virginia, up to, to be discharged. They didn't discharge them there, so I had to go up to. Yeah. That would have been in the latter part of 45? Right. I see. And uh, you have a family? Yes, I have uh, three boys and one girl. How many grandchildren? All married, and we have uh, eight grandchildren. Eight grandchildren. That's great. Do you ever have a reunion of your old outfit? Yes, they do have. And uh, until this uh, Stu Arf that I told you about from Detroit, Michigan came, I had lost contact with the 100th Division. And so he sent me some literature and, and told me how to get in contact. And uh, they have a reunion again this year. And I don't know if I'm going to get to go or not, but I'd love to. But I don't know of any, I haven't seen any names in there that I recognize. That, that seems to be the trouble, uh, trouble in the reunions. A lot of times you see that list and you don't recognize anyone. No, I don't recognize that person. Is. That is a problem. The only one that I know is this Arf, and he lives now at Ann Arbor. He's a, a professor at uh, Michigan College mm -hmm. in, in dentistry. Mm -hmm. Well, I have this has been uh, very, uh, I wouldn't say enjoyable, but uh, very enlightening. And I appreciate you taking the time this evening to come in and 
and share your experiences in World War II as a prisoner of war. Thank you. Glad you did. Yeah, appreciate it.